You'll notice um, there's something different about my soldier's grave. Arthur Schiller is one of the 145 Star of David grave markers in this entire cemetery. That's probably not representative of the number of Jews buried here. Jews were given the option of changing their dog tag designation to Christian so that in the event of capture, they would avoid the eventuality of being interned in concentration camps. It was incredibly important to me with this project to choose a soldier who self-identified as Jewish. I obtained a list from the Museum of American Jewish Military History of all the Star of David grave markers in this cemetery. Arthur Schiller was one of nine from New Jersey. I'll pose this question to all of you before I get into the meat. What would you do if you were asked to choose between a fundamental part of your identity and doing everything you can to protect your own life? Think about it. Arthur Schiller was a private in Headquarters Company, 1st Battalion, 264th Infantry Regiment, 66th Black Panther Infantry Division. Private Schiller was killed before setting foot on the shores of France when his transport, the SS Leopoldville, was struck by a torpedo, fired from a U-boat, and sunk about five miles from the port of Cherbourg. He was, relatively speaking, an insignificant figure in terms of the prosecution of the Second World War, far more notable for what he was not. He was not an officer. He never climbed through the ranks before his death in 1944. He was not part of the initial invasion, nor was his unit deployed in the initial invasion thrust. He was not on the beaches during D-Day. He did not die in battle, and he did not die executing a necessarily dangerous operation. He did not leave behind a large cadre of relatives, only a wife of three months, a brother, and possibly a sister. Arthur Schiller does, however, exemplify the archetype of many soldiers fighting in the Second World War. He was the son of immigrants and an orphan, a first-generation American Jew of Eastern European descent, finding a war to defend his way of life and dedicating himself to the cause as much as the patriotic Americans with whom he fought. Scattered resources about Private Schiller's life establish that, while perhaps not a hero in what we think of as the traditional sense, Private Arthur Schiller sh uh, should be recognized as a model of the citizen soldier that formed the bedrock of the Allied war effort. His identity begins with his parents' immigration to the United States. They were part of the Eastern European Jewish milieu arriving in the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, in response to persecution in the Pale of Settlement in Eastern Europe. His father, Isaac, was born in Poland in 1882 and immigrated to the U.S. at age 18 in the year 1900. Um, there's not much information about his mother, Martha Katz. Um, she likely was born in Hungary. And we do know that the two married and likely settled near Marlboro in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Um, uh, scant records hint at the existence of a sister, Ruth Schiller, born to Isaac and Martha in 1912, living in Monmouth County, New Jersey. That would be, she would be the oldest sibling. Um, Arthur had a brother, Harry. He was born on August 11th, 1914, in Marlboro. And Arthur was born on July 18th, 1921. He was the youngest of the three. We really don't know very much at all about Arthur's early life. Um, his parents died at some point before he was nine years old. In 1930, um, we find records of Arthur's residence at a orphanage in Brooklyn, the Hebrew National Orphan Home. This was in 1930. And according to one of the few Schiller family descendants who was, I was able to speak with, uh, Dorothy Oberly Schiller, Harry's daughter, um, her father, Harry, attended Boys High in Brooklyn and ultimately didn't graduate. Uh, we know almost nothing about Ruth. Um, records vanish until her death in 1988. Arthur resided in Jersey City by the time of his enlistment in 1942 um, on, at 769 Ocean Avenue. It's now a lot filled with empty tires. There's a record of Arthur's marriage to Esther Pinchuk of 21 Orient Avenue on September 13, 1944 in the September 8th edition of the local Jersey City newspaper, the Jersey Journal. Um, she was born in Manhattan on September 7, 1923. Her parents were part of the same Eastern European Jewish stock from which Arthur descended. Um, her father, Samuel, was born in Kobrin, Poland in 1894 and emigrated aboard the SS Zeeland. 
arrived on August 21st, 1912, was naturalized in March of 1919. Her mother, Anna Werbetschik, was born in 1895 in Skidel, Russia, now Belarus. Um, and I was able to contact, make contact with a distant relative of, of the Pinchuk side of the family who confirmed some of these details. Another detail that was confirmed um, by our, one of Arthur's last few living descendants, Dorothy Schiller, um, was of course that this was a short marriage. Arthur married Esther very shortly before shipping out, only three months. Um, and Mrs. Schiller mentioned how her father almost never spoke of Arthur or their family heritage. Only around the time that, um, uh, on the date of uh, their parents' yard site, which is the Jewish uh, death anniversary. And uh, at that time, you usually light a candle for your loved ones. And Dorothy remembered how her parents, or her, I'm sorry, her father, Harry, Arthur's brother, always made it clear that the candle was lit for his parents, and not for Arthur. There's an implication that there was some bitterness amongst the family that Arthur married so soon before shipping out, um, and his and his wife, who was barely part of the family at that point, um, made the decision to have his remains uh, stay here in Normandy. This is, of course, only speculation, but it's a sad part of the story. Um, we do know that Arthur enlisted in Newark, New Jersey, with the 66th Infantry, Infantry Division. He was activated in Florida under General uh, Brigadier General H.F. Kramer, who wanted to prepare the unit for entry into combat um, in February of 1944. Um, there were men from a very wide variety of places in this division. They underwent the typical training that we've, that we've heard about, miles long runs up mountains, weekends in nearby cities. Um, the unit was transferred to Alabama in March of 1944, where they moved to group training with live ammunition, and an emphasis on attacks of fortified areas. In October of 1944, uh, the unit prepared for shipment overseas. Um, I don't have any confirmation of this, but my guess has been that this is when Arthur traveled back to New Jersey uh, to marry Esther Pinchock. Arthur crossed the Atlantic um, aboard the SS George Washington um, and arrived in Southampton on November 6th, 1944. Um, at this point, the um, 66th Infantry Division received word uh, that they were probably going to be preparing to go over to Europe sometime soon, um, and they ultimately would be carried across the channel by a ship called the SS Leopoldville. It was built in 1929 in Belgium and had been used um, as a troop transport since the end of World War I. Um, transported RAF trainees in the interwar years after World War I, British infantry from Glasgow to Algiers for Operation Torch, and troops through the Mediterranean in Sicily. Um, on D-Day, the Leopoldville was in service, embarked from Tilbury on June 3rd, and eventually anchored at Pont du Ver on June 18th. Um, by Christmas Eve 19, 1944, the Leopoldville had made 24 crossings, carried a total of 53,217 soldiers, um, uh, and while other transport ships had been strafed, shelled, bombed, mined, and torpedo, the Leopoldville had not even been scratched in almost four years of continued service. A very lucky ship. Its luck, unfortunately, would run out soon. Um, Arthur Schiller departed Southampton um, with 2,236 officers and men of the 262nd and Arthur's 264th Infantry Regiments at 9:15 a.m. I'm sorry, 9:15 p.m. on Christmas Eve, 1944. The U-486, a U-boat under the command of First Lieutenant Gerhard Meyer was on its first war patrol since being commissioned. Um, at around, uh, at, at 1754, the U-46 fired a salvo of torpedoes at the Leopoldville. The torpedoes struck below the waterline port side aft. The E, F, and G decks partially collapsed. Um, a sergeant from the 262nd who was on board the Leopoldville uh, during the disaster described it as follows. Sometime near 1750, there was a tremendous explosion. I was blown out of the hammock with, uh, with Private First Class Vernon on top of me. At the same time, bits of the ship were flying around. The lights were out and it was very dark. I was in compartment E4. The compartment below us and part of the one I was in were blown to hell. I heard someone yell, the boiler blew up, but I could smell powder and I knew it was either a torpedo or mine. 
the British ship, the HMS Brilliant, and a U.S. Coast Guard cutter attempted a rescue. Um, at 1930, the personnel were informed that the ship would be towed in support. Um, this is about five miles off the, off the port of Cherbourg, so it wouldn't have been very far. But at 2000, uh, 2000 hours, the ship lifted, listed sharply and began its final descent into the depths of the channel. Many never left the dark waves, including Arthur Schiller. Um, another officer who was on the ship uh, described the unfortunate situation as follows. The Belgian crew, when needed, could not be found. Who is at fault, I know not, yet many lives were lost by those who reached the deck safely after the initial explosion. Over two and one half hours were available to allow the men to be evacuated from the stricken ship, if need be. Everyone, the troop commander included, was of the opinion that we were to be towed to safety. The tug never came. The crew left the ship. No abandoned ship order ever came from the crew. This was remembered as the second worst troop ship disaster of the entire war. A total of 14 officers and 748 men were lost on the Leopoldville. You might have noticed on the wall of the missing that there were many men from the 66th Infantry Division. Most of them likely died during this disaster. Um, there are no details about Arthur's actual death, apart from the fact that he died in the disaster. Um, he likely died of hypothermia or exhaustion, but we're not sure. Survivors were ordered to keep the incident secret. They were threatened with the loss of their GI benefits. It wasn't declassified until the 1990s. Um, a congressman from New York uh, noted in 1996 that the most tragic and troubling part of this story is the American public's general ignorance of the facts. All of us, and particularly the family members of the lost soldier, should be told the full story of their loved one's valiant efforts in the fight to preserve democracy. Arthur's wife, Esther Pinchuk, remarried a few years later after the war ended. And as I haven't been able to make contact with anybody who knew her personally, um, I have no idea if she ever knew the true circumstances surrounding Arthur's death um, before it became public in the mid-1990s. She died in 2010. In a war with roughly 25 million military casualties, some individual actors will inevitably remain anonymous in the collective national conscience. In the case of Arthur Schiller, a unique confluence of events compounded the mystery surrounding his life, his enlistment, and death. He was born to immigrant parents um, who settled in the New York, New Jersey area, the area with the highest density of immigrants of their ilk. His parents died when Arthur was young, leaving him in the care of a Brooklyn orphanage. He married just before deploying to Europe, driving a wedge in his posthumous relationship with his brother Harry, his one remaining relative, and one of the few potential carriers of his memory. He was a low-ranking soldier in the headquarters company of a regiment that only saw reinforcement action in the closing days of the war. He was killed in a disaster that was censored by the U.S. government for nearly 50 years. Yet his gravesite stand amongst the thousands of men who paid the ultimate price for freedom. Further, amongst the myriad values for which the 66th and every division of the Allied Expeditionary Force fought was the defense of freedom for all peoples, including the European Jewry from which Arthur Schiller descended. His sacrifice then, though it may not be one of startling heroics or battlefield courage, is one no less meaningful. A son of immigrants who died in defense of the opportunity to which his forebears were entitled. The opportunity to escape oppression, the opportunity to begin anew the quintessentially American opportunity to carve a better future for one's descendants. Private Arthur Schiller's sacrifice enabled untold millions to continue these opportunities in the decades since. The theme thus far has been our lack of knowledge about Arthur Schiller, but I'd like to refocus everyone back to the question that I asked earlier. What would you do if you were asked between choosing a, between a fundamental part of your identity and doing everything you can to protect your life? I'm not incredibly religious, um, but my Jewish identity is fundamentally important to me. I can't imagine facing the decision to give up such a critical tenet of myself, no matter the cause. Arthur and the 144 other identified Jews buried on these grounds made a decision requiring courage of a magnitude unimaginable to all of us. They stayed true to their identity in fighting for our freedom. Arthur Schiller's identity as a Jew was important. He had the opportunity to abandon this identity, but he didn't. He trained as a Jew, he shipped out to Europe as a Jew, he boarded the Leopoldville as a Jew, and he died in the English Channel as a Jew. 
In the face of an unfortunate life, Arthur Schiller clung to the one fact that no amount of hardship could alter his identity. To that end, I'm going to conclude by honoring Private Schiller in the Jewish tradition. I'd like to recite the Mourner's Kaddish, the traditional Jewish prayer of mourning and remembrance, and rather than a flower, to place stones on his grave. The prayer is in Aramaic and Hebrew, but the translation is interesting because it doesn't mention death explicitly. Death in Judaism, especially for a higher cause, is the ultimate personification of glory in the eyes of God. The stones symbolize the permanence of memory, and in the case of Private Schiller, the permanence of his sacrifice. Um, the response, Amen, is recited at certain points throughout the prayer. Maggie is familiar with the prayer and she'll respond. Feel free to join if, you're, if you'd like. Yikadavi kadash shabay rabah v'yamah divrak kiratei v'amlich marutei v'chayachon v'yomechon v'chayei dehol beit Yisrael v'agalah v'izman kariv v'imru Amen. Yehei shmei rabah mevarach le'olam omei omaya yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitbar v'yitromam v'yitnaseh v'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal shmei dekudasha v'richu le'olam in kol b'yachata v'shurata tushpachata v'nechamata Damim Ram Bilma, Vimru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, Bahaim Aleno Vilkol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. Ose Shalom, Vimrumav, Hu Ya Ase Shalom, Aleno Vilkol Yisrael, Vimru, Amen. May his memory be a blessing. <laughs>